I promise to take a deep dive into Avgas at the end of Sun and Fun. Um, so yeah, regularly scheduled uh, program here. So here it goes. I don't want to make the. I didn't want to make this video too long, so I'm going to have to break it up into several parts. I think the story is a pretty cool one. I think there's a lot of lot of stuff here we need to know. This is part one. It's back to the beginning. It's a backstory. Uh, I think you're going to be a little surprised with a little bit of a twist in here. At least I like it a lot. So stick with me on Flywire, and we'll talk about it. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to jump into the Avgas pool. And I'm going to start at the beginning, okay? I think you're going to, I think you'll like it. There's an interesting twist to the story of aviation gasoline uh, and how, how, how it worked out, okay? It's uh, not a simple path, if you will. The first thing we need to know, basically, is something about uh, gasoline engines in the 20s and 30s, 10s, 20s, and 30s. For example, typical car engines in the 30s, the horsepower was all the way up to 30 horsepower with compression ratios of about four and a half to five to one-ish. And they used a fuel that was pretty much 65 octane in that range. Pretty much the standard of that day. Uh, 40 to 55, 65 in that range. Ford came out with a V8 engine for their cars. It produced 65 horsepower. Uh, for airplanes, Continental's first airplane engine was in 1931 with the A40 clocking in at 40 horsepower. The Continental R670, which is right here, was in the mid-30s on the Stearman. It produced 220 horsepower with a 5.4 to 1 compression ratio on 65 octane fuel in the mid-30s, hence when it came into line. Functionally, 200 to 250 horsepower was the limit for aircraft engines in the 30s. The fuel available is at 65 octane and any higher compression ratio, uh, the fuel air mixture is going to become unstable during the whole burning process, uh, the, the power stroke. And put simply, when you compress the fuel air mixture about five, above about five and a half times ambient pressure, the mixture is going to burn a bit uncontrollably, okay? So you got to do something else with it. This isn't a good thing if it's burning uncontrollably. The burn process is not well controlled, bad things happen. The burn process itself leaves deposits on the top of the piston and in the cylinder, and these deposits can get hot and ignite the fuel air mixture before the spark plug fires, okay? That's called pre-ignition. And uh, that, that subsequent uncontrolled burn can lead to detonation. Detonation is really a fancy word for an explosion, okay? It's not burning nor, uh, in a controlled fashion, it detonates. Rather than burning evenly, this detonation can tear an engine apart in seconds, okay? So you don't want that. Good, bad scale, that's bad. To produce more power out of engines light enough to install in cars and airplanes, that's a problem. They have to be light, you know, in mean, a car or an airplane. Uh, you need to increase the compression ratios. Uh, to stop detonation from destroying the engine, you must change the formulation of the fuel. You have to change the chemistry of the fuel, okay? And this is where octane comes into play, okay? The definition of octane is that it's a number that you, is used to measure anti-knock properties of a motor fuel like gasoline, you know, where a higher number actually indicates less likelihood of knocking. Okay, so that's straight line. Uh, I'm, I must admit that sounds a bit vague. But to make today's automotive fuels, you rarely hear the weird rattle that is detonation or pre-ignition leading to detonation. And, but I remember it distinctly, uh, that metallic rattle in my first car when I used regular gas instead of premium, because it was supposed to use premium. Fortunately, it was mild detonation, and my dad educated me, you can say, before I had to pay for a new engine. So uh, it was a learning process. Um, light detonation, it may not necessarily hurt too bad. In the early days of the horseless carriage, you know, cars, gasoline was approximately about 40 to 55 octane uh, rating in the United States. And you bought your gas in gallon jugs at the local pharmacy. No kidding. That was your gas station. 1905 to 1910, gasoline began being sold at stations built specifically to sell larger quantities of fuel, you know, so you have a pump and you'd actually pump how many gallons you needed instead of buying it in gallon jugs. As cars got bigger, more power was needed to propel them, and the search was on to develop a higher octane additive to allow automotive and airplane engines to produce more power. You're limited in how much weight and all that stuff, so you, you have to use higher compressions to get there. Back in the 50s and 60s, folks used to call premium gas high test uh, for the higher number high test. 
typical car engine used a compression ratio of about eight and a half to one and produced about 170 horsepower into the 60s. With premium fuel, the compression ratio in some cases went to 12 to one and produced 200 to 300 horsepower. Okay, my point is that the higher the octane, that higher octane is required at higher compression ratios to prevent pre-ignition and detonation. And the parlance of the day, heavy knock was bad. The word knock itself is a way to describe the sound that detonation is uh, when you're outside the engine, okay? It's like a knock. The light rattle that I experienced was a light detonation and basically it's a warning that there's a problem. Well, this is where the Ethel Corporation came in, uh, came on the scene in 1921. They produced the additive that allowed higher fuel octane ratings and more power to be drawn from the engines of the day. This is tetraethyl lead. Okay, it's a long chain molecule that, molecule that looks a bit like this here. Okay, it required a mixture with other stuff to prevent uh, the byproduct buildup, uh, which is when you burn it, uh, it has a lot of deposits and stuff, but if they, you put this other stuff in it, it would tend to scavenge it out of the, in, into the gas that was exhausted. It worked very well and it was fairly cheap and in the 50s I think it was found to be toxic to the human brain, yikes. You had to be very careful when handling it. A lot of people actually uh, died with uh, tetraethyl lead uh, production before they figured that one out. Most folks think probably that high octane number means more powerful fuel. But running high test, by, by running high test, you get more power out of the engine. In a way, that's exactly opposite of what the reality is. The fuel additive that enables that high octane number, the tetraethyl lead, actually slows the fuel burn down, which ensures the burn starts with the spark plug. A subset of that is cetane. It's another additive that actually slows the ignition time, how quickly it lights. But the high octane prevents pre-ignition, which in turn inhibits detonation. Kind of a complex chemical reaction here. You do get more power because the flame front burns in a controlled manner inside the cylinder at much higher compression ratios. Okay, and with turbo supercharged engines, uh, it went pretty high. Uh, high octane enables high compression and high horsepower torque production without tearing the engine apart. More power is always good, I think. Maybe you. Remember, all these engines need to be t light and there's a limit to how much bigger uh, displacement's gonna help you. After World War II, regular fuel, uh, as an example, was about 79 octane and premium was about 85. By the late 60s, regular was uh, 86 octane and premium was 94. There are a couple of different methods to measure octane rating, particularly for car gas, and, and I don't really find it important in this discussion. Is it Ron, is it Mon, is it a combination of the two divided by two? I don't know. Who cares? Just realize that we're different ways to measure and advertise that rating, okay? The goal is all the same. Air pollution from cars was a problem and tetraethyl lead did contribute to that problem. The big contributor to the air pollution was actually NOx, nitrous oxygen, oxide, a byproduct of the fuel combustion. When released in the atmosphere and exposed to sunlight, it creates a smog. I remember flying into Los Angeles in the 70s and seeing this yellow soup of air as you're descending on final approach into LAX. Yuck, I'm gonna breathe that stuff. The catalytic converter was invented and started in, uh, uh, being rolled out in cars about 75, and that removed NOx from the automotive gas. The trouble is, is that tetraethyl lead byproducts coat the catalytic converter, making it useless. That heralded the rollout of unleaded car gas in the 80s and the 90s. And as I remember somewhere in the late 80s, uh, it was unleaded was it, it was the thing. Unleaded car gas essentially has a limit of 97 octane and is not suitable for higher compression engines. And, that, and there's the rub. Uh, it seems natural that tetraethyl lead was used in aviation gasoline to us now basically, but it was actually wasn't an easy transition. Okay, there was a lot of resistance to it. Change? Resist change? Can you imagine that? This is a twist that I find interesting. You might remember a fellow named Jimmy Doolittle. He really was an incredible guy, did a lot of stuff. Uh, he was an Air Corps fighter pilot. He happened to get his PhD in aeronautical engineering. He was the first one to get that degree at MIT uh, in 1929. He set world speed records in competitions and was deeply involved in the development of blind flying instruments. He's the guy who made the first flight. We'll take off all the landing, to landing and uh, blind flying. Okay, and that was in September of 29, you know, so very important. He did it with Sperry gyros. 
In 1930s, he went to work for Shell Oil Company. He was active in the Air Corps, but he remained in the Air Corps Reserve. In World War II, he led the Doolittle Raid on Japan and later commanded the 15th Air Force in the Mediterranean Theater and then the 8th Air Force in Europe. Okay, so he, he did a lot of stuff. He was a very, uh, very amazing guy. His work at Shell is important here, where he, he oversaw the aviation department, and uh, that's what's important to our story. At that time, aviation gasoline was about 70 to 80 octane and something like that. He pushed for 100 octane to the point where the Air Corps mandated 100 octane nav gas for combat aircraft. I mean, he pushed the, the, the let's have a, a need for it in combat airplanes, and now we need to make more of it so it's less expensive. And in the mid 30s, uh, they were able to produce 100, 130 aviation fuel. Okay, it's very expensive. Uh, and he continued to set speed records using Shell Aviation gasoline. And then a French engineer named Houdre immigrated to the U.S. and he brought his process of refining 100, 130 low, uh, Avgas with him originally, and he worked originally for Sun Oil. Jimmy Doolittle was a very strong advocate of the new process, and without his involvement, refining the new fuel at large scale probably would not have been in a, would have allowed the first plant to go online in time, just in time, to be used by the British uh, RAF uh, in the Battle of Britain, okay? That 100, 130 octane increased the speed of Spitfires by 25 to 30 miles an hour, making it equal to or superior than the uh, ME-109 at all altitudes, okay? So it made a huge difference. Eventually, the U.S. developed 115, 145 AV gas, which was critical for the big bore, ultra high power radials and liquid cooled engines of the fighters that won the war, uh, and bombers too. For uh, most of the war, the Germans were unable to produce aviation gasoline above about 91, maybe to 100 octane. Japan's aviation gasoline peaked at 87 to 91 octane. Jimmy Doolittle had the vision to push for conditions that would allow widespread use of high octane aviation gas for the Allies. At the end of the war, they had 17 plants making uh, avgas. One of the few significant factors, that, and this was one of the few significant factors that were critical to winning World War II. I remember 100, 130, uh, and 100, 100, 115, 145 being available at Cardi's, the local grass strip, where my dad kept the steerman here. 100, 130 comprises of 0.12% uh, uh, tetraethyl lead. 100 low lead began, when they began that, uh, it had, in the 80s, it contains about just a little less than half of that in tetraethyl lead. At uh, such low levels, uh, the relatively small amounts of fuel used in aviation, that lead is not a huge impact on the environment. Multiple studies have been made and no direct correlation problems have been revealed. When referring to avgas, 100 to 130 means is that when you're cruising, you use the lower number, using a lean mixture, uh, you have an octane rating of 100. When you're using high manifold pressures and high compression, high RPM, uh, like during a takeoff uh, or an air-to-air -air fight, it has the 130 octane at rich power settings, so lean rich. 100 low lead with a little less than half that lead uh, from 100 130 supports about, it, it cannot support 130 octane requirement at higher power settings. That's why higher power, high power supercharged and turbocharged engines cannot use the original design power settings, and they knew that in World War II. And this chart, this uh, booklet right here tells you what power settings you have to use with different fuels. 100 low lead just doesn't have enough tetraethyl lead to prevent knock and detonation at those higher power, higher power settings. The status quo for 100 low lead has been widespread use for decades. It's, it's been around everywhere. It displaced everything else. But today we find ourselves with two major problems. The biggest vulnerability is, is that there's only one supplier of tetraethyl lead for aviation gasoline there in the UK. A lot of pressure on them, and the production of that TEL is a very dirty process and very toxic. And the sole company that has stated their desire to cease production of tetraethyl lead in 2030. That's five years, less than five years. Real environmental concerns exist in the production of tetraethyl lead. It's no kidding toxic. The existence of TEL is not long for this world. You just got to accept it, okay? There's got to be something different, and we got to find it. So argue about it doesn't matter. The other problem is that lead is the lead in 100 low lead. Even if it's a small amount, it makes it a target, okay? Doesn't matter if it's small, it just is. That makes all of us and our airplanes a target as well, okay? The time has come 
my friends, to talk of many things, of unleaded fuel and whether we'll have wings. And that brings me to the next chapter in this series, okay, part two plus, where we're going with this. Unleaded fuel options in the way forward. I think it's time for a road trip or two. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.